So welcome. I would like to take the time to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I would also like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Thank you for joining us for this lecture today. This is our second hybrid meeting of the Catalyst program sponsored by the Peter Wall Institute of Advanced Studies. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to remind you of some housekeeping notes. The first half of the event will be a presentation by the speaker. Following this, we will have a Q&A session. People in the audience in person can raise their hand during the Q&A if they have a question. People on Zoom, please put your questions in the Q&A box. Your questions will be asked on behalf of you by our moderator, Dr. Penny Gerstein. If there are any technical issues, please write your question in the chat box. So we are privileged to have Dr. Craig Brown here. He is a climate change and health lead at Vancouver Coastal Health. In this public health role, he supports climate change adaptation and mitigation projects with a strong emphasis on community collaboration, equity and reconciliation. Craig is also an author on national and international climate assessments, including the IPCC sixth assessment report. And he is an associate faculty member at Royal Roads University in the Master of Arts in Climate Action Leadership Program. Very special welcome to you, Craig. And the lecture title is Health, Equity, and Collaboration as Catalysts for Regional Climate Adaptation in BC. Thank you. Thanks everybody, very nice to be here. And to those of you online. Thanks for the nice introduction, Olev, I appreciate that. And we'll get into it. I've, uh, I'm kind of speaking from two different roles, which Olev mentioned, uh, my role at Vancouver Coastal Health as a climate change and health lead, which is very much a practitioner role. And I'm also an associate faculty at Royal Roads University. And, uh, have participated in these knowledge assessments, which puts me in touch somewhat with the researcher. I'm not an active researcher per se, although as I was discussing at lunch, we do have many, many topics that we're uh, looking forward to, to diving into. So to start, we'll start with a discussion of Canada's National Climate Assessment, which I was a coordinating lead author for the British Columbia chapter and for the cities and towns chapter. I started as the, the CLA for the cities and towns uh, chapter and ended with a, an additional role on the British Columbia chapter, which is a story I'll tell another day. But for those of you um, that aren't familiar, sorry, just there we go. Uh, this is a, you know, it's a, it's a national uh, project overseen by National Resource, Natural Resources Canada, happens every, uh, you know, four or five years, and it kind of mirrors what the IPCC does, but at a national level, they've broken, uh, uh, broken things down in, 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 in ways that I'll describe on the next slide. But what it is, is it's meant to be a knowledge assessment that produces, the words they use are credible, useful, and decision-relevant products, i.e. chapters, for a variety of users across Canada. So it's not a policy prescriptive process. We as, as authors were encouraged never to use the, the thou shalt uh, language, but certainly to lead the horse to water and to provide a lot of different uh, examples of impacts, but especially examples of, of, of adaptation, best and promising practices. And so again, I'll speak to the British Columbia chapter uh, and which is situated within it's, it's the star in the middle of the screen there. Uh, and I think all but one of the chapters, the, the Northern chapter is still yet to be released in the regional perspectives report, 
Many of you will be familiar with Canada Changing Climate Report, which came out back in 2018. Uh, the national issues, regional perspectives, and the health assessment, like I said, largely released, uh, and everything's on changingclimate.ca. The exciting thing, for me at least, is this Indigenous Resilience Report that's coming soon. I think we're within three or four months of that, and that'll be, you know, all of our chapters were encouraged to have, uh, you know, an Indigenous-led and Indigenous-focused component, but this is a completely standalone process. It's been underway for a few years, and so... Uh, we're all kind of waiting with bated breath for that. Just very quickly, uh, it's a big team that put this together. Just like my role at Vancouver Coastal Health, I'm, I'm part of this nexus of amazing people. So I was one of those 17 coordinating lead authors, but supported by many other authors uh, and a ton of expert reviewers. So the process for developing these chapters, as you are all no doubt aware, uh, is iterative and we you know, we consult experts in deciding what our key messages are going to be. Uh, and we went out for one big formal round of, uh, of feedback that has a, just like the IPCC, it has a transparent response. You know, you're meant to collate all the responses and those are publicly available. Okay, so the chapter itself, uh, which I'll go into a little bit of detail on, it's focused on impacts and adaptation. Uh, it's based on, like I said, the section authors and it's situated within that large constellation of the national assessment process. What we did early from the beginning is a guy named Fred Lipschultz from the US who's been part of their national assessments was really, uh, I think correctly adamant that we focus on key messages in a, in a process like this and write around the key messages. And so early on, we kind of surfaced those through expert engagement and decided those key areas that we were gonna focus on. The, the nice thing I think about the chapter is that it includes a case story, we call it a case story for each of the, the five key messages, which is, it kind of helps us to bypass being rooted just in the literature, because we could just collect a story from, say, a practitioner that hadn't been published and include it. So it was a nice way to augment uh, the published academic and gray literature. So our key messages, uh, the, the, the five that you see on the screen, are, are not meant to be exhaustive. These aren't all the issues that are faced uh, in British Columbia, but they're the five that the team, when the chapter was created, decided to focus on. And I'll go into a bit of detail on the first three relating to indigenous adaptation, uh, impacts and adaptation, uh, the, the flooding message and the final message. I, I won't speak to forestry and agriculture just uh, for time constraints, but also it's really not my area of expertise. It's quite far afield from what I'm keen to, to speak about. So there's plenty of information there, and I can always put you in touch with the authors if there's, if there's interest. Okay, so our first key message, this was written by primarily by Denny Clement, um, Indigenous author and researcher and now practitioner, but with input from uh, a number of different folks. And, you know, it's hard to produce slides like this without sounding self-evident, but uh, you know, the first is that we know that, that uh, First Nations are experiencing the impacts in unique ways. Uh, some of the things that they value uniquely are, are jeopardized here and are being impacted. Uh, we also, I think the most exciting part about the chapter is that because it's only about a year old, we were able to capture some really exciting work. So you know, we now have this BC First Nations Climate Strategy and Action Plan that'll come up later in my talk. Uh, we were able to include a text box on that in the chapter. So um, examples of Indigenous-led adaptation is really important. We're trying to um, get away from that language of, of supporting Indigenous-led efforts and, and to more of centering uh, that work and, and yeah, finding ways to, to uh, fit into that uh, those initiatives. And of course, the last point, which they go into in a bit of depth in the, uh, in the chapter is just, you know, this, this governance space, this, this uh, effort of reconciliation is really uh, not, maybe not in its infancy, but there's certainly a lot of room to, uh, to get better at it. And, you know, that'll come up in the, in my health focus talk in a moment too. The second message again, which is fairly, uh, fairly um, intuitive to most people is that flooding is a major concern in the province. We did try in this section to touch on some of the ways that hydrological regimes are gonna change, 
And I, I should say too, that I'm not, I'm not going into all of the different uh, hazard projections and stuff like that, changes in precipitation. And I'll talk a little bit about drought and heat during the, the second part of the talk, but um, we're really just focused here on the impacts and on the key messages. And so I think the second message is really important that, that there are a lot of folks that are already taking action on this. Uh, sometimes in the media, we, we can get a message that it's, that we're really lagging behind, or it, it can often imply that action hasn't been taken. And the truth is that local governments are in a tough spot. They've received this responsibility over the years in increasing ways. And um, it's a difficult challenge. It's an, it's an expensive challenge. Uh, and I think that some of the bullets in the, in, the, in the third point there about overlapping jurisdictional mandates and the like, um, are really are really important and they they do get fleshed out in the in the chapter and so again I think you know flood risk governance as an area of academic practice is fairly well established uh, I still think again there's a lot of room for innovation I don't know what everybody's um, prerogatives are in the in the room or online or that might view this but uh, it's an exciting space it's an evolving space and it's e even foundational products still floodplain maps in this in this day and age, a, a brand new report, the Disaster Risk Reduction Pathways report that came out in September, you know, found the the, the last point there that, uh, you know, we still don't have a national provincial platform uh, for all the publicly funded flood models and maps, which is fairly astounding, uh, especially in the age of GIS. We have all sorts of fantastic platforms. Uh, it's, it's also maybe there's another word beyond astounding, you know, I was privy in a postdoc to work with insurance companies who have like extremely detailed flood maps and models that are obviously proprietary and maybe rightfully so, but need to be liberated, need to be on a, on a, on a publicly available platform, whether that's through payment and licensing, whatever it is, but it just feels, it feels unbelievable that this is still a message in 2022. And I know it's complex, but you've, maybe you've come across the Fraser Basin Council maps for the lower mainland that model out, you know, floods out to 2100 under various climate change scenarios. They've even produced dynamic kind of videos that show the impacts of flooding in the region. So there's really impressive work that's been done. Uh, but again, a little astounding that we're still in this, in this place. The final key message that I'll speak to, this was meant when I got involved in the chapter, we didn't have kind of a catch-all space for summarizing or characterizing adaptation action in the province, and we knew we needed one. So I think that the message for me that's heartening is that we're entering the era of implementation. For many of you, you know, we were in the adaptation kind of life cycle. You're, you're, you're doing your vulnerability and risk assessments, then you're moving on to create plans. Then you're moving on to take action and, and to measure the impact of that action. So it's heartening to know that we're, we're able to say with some certainty that we're at least uh, to some capacity in the implementation area. For those of us in the field uh, or even just watching it, you can tell that this field is maturing. We've, you know, British Columbia is a leader in many ways, including climate mitigation and adaptation. Uh, so it's not surprising that, uh, that this field is relatively well supported. Uh, you've got national products too now, like the climatedata.ca that are very powerful sources of data that didn't even exist five years ago. So it's a rapidly evolving space. We tried to capture that in the chapter, but the last point is really, I think uh, it's a very difficult question for an assessment of this nature to answer is, is the level of action commensurate with the level of risks faced? You know, you've got two moving targets. Uh, we don't really know how to characterize the level of risks faced. We've tried. There's a there's a provincial strategic climate risk assessment. We have a sense of of the magnitude of the risks we face, but the fact is that that's a dynamic process. And so too is the level of action being taken and planned. And there's all sorts of ways to model this. We couldn't get into those in the uh, in the chapter, in part because this was a knowledge assessment. We weren't creating research, and so again to those thinking about research priorities, uh, certainly trying to answer that question uh, feels, feels like one of them that came out of this process. And finally, uh, to put a finer point on some of the things that the chapter identified as, as really uh, important gaps or emerging issues. So the first I, I spoke to just now, 
it's a better understanding of what those some of those future risks look like. Uh, so even drought, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, do we have models at our fingertips that we can we can see out? And and to the extent that we don't, do we know why we don't have those? Uh, and I think it's really important too to point out that this is an opportunity where you know Western science and indigenous knowledge systems can uh, and should uh, intermingle and and find ways to produce knowledge that are novel. Uh, Second point here in terms of, you know, a knowledge gap or an emerging issue is it's this tension between uh, reactive emergency management and proactive adaptation planning that still is, is there. It still is evident. Uh, the, you know, the atmospheric river of 2021 showed us just what happens. You know, I don't think I can go into the particulars. Maybe you know them, but uh as soon as those highways washed away, it, it took a lot of money away from the adaptation planning resources in the province, including for the health sector. And so that's just really unfortunate. Um, as a field, I, I, it's difficult to know what to do to resolve that. You're always going to be responding to emergencies. But I think what's happening is, is the field of emergency management is starting to think uh, more proactively and to connect more formally with climate change adaptation. The regional cost, uh, regional and sector-based cost and benefit analyses. There's a great chapter. Maybe you've seen Richard Boyd speak. Uh, there's a, on changingclimate.ca in the National Issues volume, chapter six, I believe it is. So these these methods are starting to to be refined and to rise to the challenge. But again, I think there's a huge opportunity here for researchers to come up with better ways to quantify the cost of inaction, to demonstrate return on investment for adaptation options, and to model model choices. There's a lot of work that consultants do, I think, to do this. And a lot of that stays behind closed doors. So again, it's for me, uh, just kind of there's a there's a bit of a knowledge liberation uh, dimension to this, I think. The last couple points, um, I think it's an essential role of Indigenous leadership and knowledge and adaptation. That's what came up more than a few times in this chapter is that we can't do this as a province, for example, certainly as a country if we're not also doing uh, reconciliation effectively, whatever that means in, in different contexts. And I'm gonna to speak to the last two points uh, in the context of my climate change and health role at Vancouver Coastal Health. So I won't go into those now, just to say that, that effective collaboration, governance, coordination, uh, and monitoring and evaluation were identified as kind of these, these emerging issues or these key areas um, that we need to address going forward. So that kind of concludes just part one of you know, the, the British Columbia chapter within the national assessment. I'll talk now about my day-to-day -day role at Vancouver Coastal Health, but specifically, again, trying to tie it back to what could be some research priorities uh, and trying to put a finer point on just the nature of the climate emergency from a health perspective. So Vancouver Coastal Health is huge. There's one of five regional health authorities plus the First Nations Health Authority that serve British Columbia. Uh, you know, it's, it's somewhat unique in Canada. We, we provide all those hospital services, everything that you would conventionally associate with a, with a health authority. I'm speaking from the lesser, sometimes considered branch of public health, uh, which is really primarily concerned with protecting health in the community. Uh, and that's, you know, climate change work is taking place across all of these different areas to one degree or another. Uh, but for us, public health is a really valuable entity in this effort to make communities uh, resilient as the climate changes. We operate in a pretty complex uh, environment. We've got 14 First Nations uh, and several Métis Charter communities that are part of our uh, health region. And so it's been a very kind of edifying part of my role is, is working on building some of those relationships and figuring out how best we can serve those folks, those communities, how we fit in the constellation with First Nations Health Authority, with the province, with community uh, delivered health services. So it's been, again, really an enjoyable part of the work and, and, a, and a challenging part. So I mentioned this at lunch, but climate change and health adaptation, if we're going to call that a field, and it, it increasingly is a field, was really kickstarted by this federal program called Health Adapt. Uh, which uh, funded 10 health organizations across Canada with three years of funding 
They could they could create positions and hire staff. They could hire consultants. It was a variety of projects were done with a, a variety of different foci and ours out here, Vancouver Coastal Health. We were partnered with Fraser Health and with Health Emergency Management BC. I'm not going to go into too many particulars of the project, but this is just the the kind of the origin story. And I think it's really important that that Health Canada get credit for kind of kickstarting this. Uh, you know, we sometimes wonder how these fields of practice take shape, and this is was an important part. So our project essentially had two two dimensions, which was to do a climate change vulnerability and capacity assessment for the health region, and to the second blurred out part is to produce a, a strategic plan, essentially. So not rocket science, but what I can say is that climate change and health vulnerability assessments or vulnerability and capacity assessments, this is a, a, a fairly nascent methodological space. There was some guidance from Health Canada and others, but we were really out on our own. It was quite uh, quite difficult to figure this out. How did you want a question? Yes, but step by step, I think the ways to apply this in a public health realm or within a health authority was really, it was difficult to, to kind of, especially with the guidance I suppose we had received. Maybe we save it for the q and I'm happy to chat about it now too. At any rate, they're completed, which is nice. Uh, so, um, you know, we're happy to be on this side of the process. We were continually figuring out how we can represent the findings of this. We're always in a public health role. We're in a difficult spot with knowledge mobilization. We're always considered with how to get the message out. And so this is just an example of one of our, our, our graphics. But what we've been able to do is build on this uh, even recently. So we're now responding to requests for information around uh, around climate change and drinking water. We've been asked to present several times this fall on this. The, the story just that this, this is meant to situate us to make an explicit connection between climate change and health using drinking water as an example. Uh, we're seeing right now that a lot more of the province than we'd like to see is under uh, severe droughts, which again, isn't, uh, completely novel situation, but it is fairly alarming. There's a, um, it looks like there'll be a reprieve on the Sunshine Coast, but we're now involved in these emergency operation centers for if and when the hospital doesn't have the water that it needs to function, which is uh, fairly unprecedented. And, and not to cause too much alarm, I think they'll address it and the rain will come, but uh, <clears throat> it's been a, it's been a very challenging time and one, you know, an opportunity for us to try and articulate some of these benefits. I pulled this slide. Uh, this was probably now 10 days old, but uh, you've seen these figures, no doubt, in the media, and it's it's very alarming. I just want to provide a little bit of, of, of actual examples of how this plays out uh, in people's lives and what public health needs to do to show up in this space is the water quantity disruptions. So this is just a lack of availability um, we're seeing, yeah, right now in Seashelt, there's a, you know, there's a ban on, on, on big commercial uses, breweries, et cetera, that, that, uh, that are just not able to access, uh, treated water right now, but it's also these exposures that can happen as a result of drought conditions. So we're all worried now in developing messaging around the first rains that are going to come. We hope they're not, uh, severe, but there's obviously, um, there's risk of higher pathogen loads that, uh, can contaminate rivers, lakes, other water sources. There's also just the, the stagnation when this water is not moving as it normally does, can lead to some of these vector-borne diseases. There's other less expected, uh, and we're getting more information on this, but for now, uh, we've heard uh, that the shortages can cause farmers to use recycled water. Uh, I don't know the extent to which this is the case here in British Columbia. We're, we're figuring that out, but uh, and finally, I think this is maybe something that interests some of you in the room, but it, it comes back to, to, to personal behavior change and to appeals to folks to, to switch other using water in their homes and in their businesses, which is uh, not always straightforward. So just to, again, give us a, a little insight into the, the, the real connections between climate change and health here in British Columbia. Of course, the, the great example uh, was the 2021 extreme heat emergency. Uh, 
you know, records broken across the province. For for those of us in the field, and maybe you've experienced something like this in your own fields, there's there really was like pre-heat dome and post-heat dome. So up until you know June of last year, I spent quite a lot of time still trying to convince folks uh, that we needed to be taking action, building political will, all of that. And as soon as the heat dome happened, we switched into this space where now we have more cooks than ever in the kitchen, which is great, but it also adds kind of complexity to this space where we know we need to take uh, collaborative action. Uh, and it's and it's it it's been hard to keep up with all of the different initiatives underway and to make sure they're coordinated. And I'll speak to that in a moment. But by and large, I can say that it did serve. It was tragic, right? Over 600 deaths across the province. Uh, but what we can say is that it has motivated a level of coordination and collaboration that was really it was nascent before, now it's quite formalized as I'll discuss. And that's, uh, you know, one of the silver linings and something you would hope to see as a result of, a, of an event like this. It's been studied too. I think it'll be studied for the rest of our lives. Uh, we're continuing to learn what happened during that, the BC Center for Disease Control and my colleague, Sarah Henderson, who's absolutely amazing in this space and should be considered the absolute authority on this uh, has started to publish some papers just showing, you know, we're all very concerned about who is the most impacted, right? I'm going to speak about health equity in a moment. We want to make sure that we're uh, targeting our programs to those who need it most. And I think that uh, findings like the ones on the left, yes, it's the elderly, but it really is this, this concept of intersectionality too, which can mean a lot of things, but at the very least, it, it means the risks are higher when you're exposed to multiple risk factors, right? Which is is not uh, is not rocket science, but we're still finding ways to 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 demonstrate that using existing data and methods. Uh, but for now, we know that material deprivation, social isolation, sometimes are grouped together with material and social deprivation, but mental illness, substance use, and pre-existing illnesses are all those things that that. Uh, led to adverse impacts during the the extreme heat emergency in 2021 and subsequent to this you know you'll see this is informed communication materials and programs so it's it's again research kind of real world research solving problems for us so that we can take an evidence-formed approach when we're designing programs uh, but there's still a ton of research to do here i'm going to switch now to some of the things that we are doing because i think especially with presentations like this, uh, you can spend a little too much time in the doom and the gloom. Um, I'm supported by this amazing team. We were, I mean, it was really two people three plus years ago. Uh, and now we've got more and more, uh, they're not all full time on this, but uh, you've got some SCARP grads on there, uh, Penny, which is, which is nice, but uh, an amazing team. And, and far be it for me to, to appear like I'm taking credit for some of the work I'm about to share. It's definitely been a team effort. A lot of our works, this, this was the second deliverable from our Health Adapt project. And it's meant to show one of the ways that we as a, as a health authority and as a public health entity developed our strategic priorities and have organized them. And so we did fairly extensive engagement. This was all during COVID. So we became experts at Zoom and Mural and all the rest of it and convened groups with the folks that we collaborate with and the communities that we serve to make sure that we were being responsive uh, to their needs, that we were kind of co-producing our priorities. And you can see that we've organized them under these uh, six pillars, which give you a sense at a high level of the kind of core areas where we wanted to focus right now. The one that's missing that you might see, and, and so facilities came through a partnership with facilities management there. You know, they're the ones who are overseeing how do we make our hospitals and our clinics and every other healthcare facility safe and resilient and low carbon. The other would be health service delivery, um, which would fall under this broader umbrella of the health system. And we just, we tried and got a certain way on that, but we needed the province as kind of the, I don't know, like a linchpin of the, of the, of the, the endeavor to 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 show up so that they could kind of consider the health system the resilience of the health system so anyways this is one of the ways to kind of frame how public health shows up in an adaptation and resilience capacity in the climate emergency in bc another way 
which I think is useful and has been useful in other presentations is just to show this comes from uh, the National Collaborating Center for Healthy Public Policy. And it just shows some of the ways that public health, uh, some of the competencies that we bring when we, we do a lot of our work in partnership, right? Uh, in fact, we function as planners some of the times too. So a lot of policy development and advocacy, uh, but also kind of bringing, uh, you know, this understanding of the social determinants of health and health equity. Uh, we kind of have a, a bit of a moral authority in that space that's been uh, fun to inhabit. And as I kind of mentioned before, communication materials are quite, uh, quite an important part of what we do as well. So I'll show you, it's really nice to be kind of through this phase of our work. You know, we needed these two guides, especially the provincial one uh, was reviewed extensively. What I can say now is that VCH at least has this for all of our spaces, these are daycare facilities, uh, long-term care, et cetera. Uh, and when we couple it with the extreme heat preparedness guide that prepared BC put out, and again, I was part of the review process. It was really amazing to see the, the melding of the minds that went into producing this product, but we're now post, we don't need these resources anymore and folks don't need to uh, necessarily develop them. We can augment them, sure, the, the thinking will be refined, but I think what we need to do now is really demonstrate the impact utility of some of these guides. What's the uptake look like? So there is this, again, this kind of like impact assessment or monitoring evaluation um, dimension here that's really interesting. One of the other ways if we go, uh, you're not meant to be able to read this slide, but this is just a, a snapshot of our, of our uh, uh, public health surveillance kind of dashboard that we see internally, which starts to show where those uh, emergency department visits uh, uh, are originating from. Uh, we are in this process of getting better at sharing this data with our community partners. So all through the heat warnings this year, we're in meetings with the city of Vancouver uh, to share uh, to share this, not in real time, but to share yesterday's numbers so that they can help plan for today. There's a real opportunity here though, to disaggregate this data, uh, to see who is most affected, uh, to see, you know, we're working on a partnership with BC Emergency Health Services, which is who oversees the ambulances, to see where ambulance calls are originating from. The point of this is to say that we're down the road on monitoring in near real time the health impacts of climate change, but that we're not at the place where we need to be yet. And so, again, a role for health researchers and others uh, to kind of drive this work. Uh, yeah. And, and, Say it again. If you look at the graph, yep. you have a, quite a nice peak earlier on, but it doesn't really affect visits. But then later on, here, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. No, I don't know. I know that what we talk about. On the media coverage of the heat dome? That's a, no. <laughs> like. <laughs> I think you might find that the cause for the visits is the heat dome. Is, is the coverage tuning people in to the fact that they might be not feeling well. That could be. I think that there's also this kind of accumulation that happens where... There is, but the earlier research shows that that occurs every four days. Yeah. No, and it is, it's a great question. I'm, this is when I wish I had my colleague, Michael Schwant here, the public health doctor, because we would, we would dive into this, but we'll, I'll get back to you on that. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, some of the projects that we've developed uh, in the last year or so, what the extreme heat emergency kind of triggered among many of us was this need to do seasonal readiness planning across all of our programs. So we knew, I think when we show up to support communities that they're gonna ask us what we're doing rightfully. Uh, and so uh, these seasonal readiness plans are now in place for many, uh, all of the, core kind of service areas at Vancouver Coastal Health. These are the projects that are more uh, public health driven. So there's this heat check-in support framework. So basically BC Center for Disease Control took the research about who was most impacted during the extreme heat emergency, 
uh, and produced kind of a checklist and a guide that you can use when you go to a door to do a wellness check. Because I think the key message was obviously there's really no top-down response that's going to save everybody. Uh, the social connectedness, neighbors checking in on neighbors is really one of the key strategies to protecting health during events like this. Uh, so they produced a guide that got you most of the way. If you showed up at someone's door, you could kind of do a quick assessment as a lay person as to whether they were having a heat related illness. What we did is took that a step further and said, if you're an organization that knows you wanna check in on your community members, uh, we produced some guidance uh, for them to do that. So how do you recruit volunteers? What are some of the legal implications? You know, If you go to a door and somebody doesn't want help, but you know they need help, what do you do? So we tried to create kind of a process that they could use uh, to guide that work. So that's been really exciting. And we've now kind of stepped in as this, you know, we, we've provided trainings to community-based organizations uh, and also um, are able to respond to their requests in near real time during heat events. So again, it didn't get really hot this summer. We had a few heat warnings, uh, but uh, this is kind of a, a, a somewhat of a new dimension for public health um, in the context of climate change. We continue to advocate and support for that social connectedness, uh, whether that's partnering with researchers, whether it's partnering with community-based organizations. This is a space that we, as public health, want to get into more. And there's a neat, uh, I say neat because of my next slide that is coming up, but uh, we believe that uh, cool spaces are essential for protecting public health. Um, the city of Vancouver passed this uh, building bylaw that all uh, I believe it's part three buildings, the larger buildings uh, starting in 2025 require cooling uh, and filtration. Now, how do you might be, you might be laughing because of the, the article that came out of the Globe and Mail from uh, some of our, you know, we, we work very closely with uh, Dr. Brower on our maps that I'll talk about in a minute, but this is just, for me, it's evidence of the fact that this, there's multiple perspectives on this. I right now inhabit the public health perspective, which says cool spaces keep people alive, and that's what we want. I think there's uh, an argument here that closed up spaces with uh, mini split heat pumps that just recirculate indoor air repeatedly could get pretty unhealthy fairly quickly too. Moreover, especially outside of British Columbia, we can't just air condition our way out of this crisis. We need all of those kind of passive cooling measures. Their point is that uh, indoor air pollution, yeah. Oh, sure. So the question is kind of what's the, what is the authors of the article's main point? And uh, one of the responses, yeah, from the audience, right, that I agree with, it's indoor air pollution. So if, in this case, you're not drawing in fresh air, if we use heat pumps, you know, it's just a, it's a circulating fan on the wall with heat being transferred to the outside from a, a, a you know, a plumbing system, basically. And so you're recirculating indoor air, indoor contaminants build up, you're now exposing an occupant. Sure, they're cool, but their indoor air quality is very poor. Uh, and so I, I think that's point one. And point two is probably that air conditioning adds obviously a burden to the electrical grid. BC Hydro says to be thinking about this. Uh, and in our province, we have relatively clean electricity, obviously. But in provinces like Ontario, Alberta, cleaner, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I enjoy this. The other thing is that the city of Vancouver. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. The city of Vancouver, I'll call air conditioning in large buildings for at least a day. Yeah. Which is like King Canute standing in front of the tide and saying, I'm not going to drown. Yeah. I really don't understand that. So, is there now integration between this adaptation planning and the mitigation plan? Really good question. And I don't know. I don't know how they think about that internally. I've we were involved with them when this article came out. We helped kind of craft a response from the public health perspective. Um, you, my assumption is that they don't think this jeopardizes their mitigation targets. 
I know. Microphone. I'm sorry, just one more time. I, Absolutely. I apologize. No, no. But honestly, I did a project with the US EPA on this very topic mm -hmm. in the mid 90s. Yeah. And for us to continue to struggle with this in British Columbia and Canada as a whole, yeah. it really is mind boggling. Mm -hmm. And just to make it clear, though, so you're pro cooling, pro. Absolutely. I mean, we, yes, absolutely. Yeah. We, we've known how to deal with this since yeah. the Philadelphia heat wave in the 80s, mm -hmm. right? And your risk factors were identified back in the 80s. Yeah. So it's been very clear what we need to do and, and proactive measures to protect the folks who are at risk haven't been made, on set, unfortunately. Yeah. I don't think this is a research question, it's an implementation and adaptation question. Yeah. And the city has been relatively blind to the question of adaptation and mitigation combined, yeah. only focusing on green space and walkable places. That doesn't do it. And I certainly, when this came out, I shared some of that um, frustration. I have to be a little more diplomatic probably right now, but it was, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. I understand you have to be more diplomatic. Yeah. Okay. This, I think another important dimension of all of this is this equity dimension. And this graphic, which was produced by the Climate Action Secretariat here in British Columbia, it's just a really easy kind of way into this, that health outcomes on the right are determined by all of these mediating factors in the center of this sphere. Uh, and so this is meant to kind of tune us in and remind us about how health equity uh, takes shape. And I'm going to speak, yeah, I'm going to speak to a few uh, points here about how we've started to operationalize this concept, which again, I would agree with uh, Heidi there that you know, equity is not new. I think equity as a concept that permeates all of our work is somewhat new. And equity as a how do you actually do it uh, question is, is certainly uh, top of mind for a lot of folks. So here's the partnership that started with uh, Dr. Brower from UBC. Uh, he had a doctoral student, Jessica Yu, who was able to do an extensive review that talked about the various factors uh, that made somebody susceptible uh, or sensitive during each of those four hazards at the bottom of the screen. And through a variety of principal components analysis and others produced these indices, vulnerability indices for each of those four hazards. We inherited those maps, did a whole bunch of engagement on how best to mobilize that information. So now you can, you know, with with each of the maps, they cover three health regions now, Vancouver Coastal Health, Fraser Health, and Interior Health. Soon they'll be across the province. They're not perfect, but what they do is they provide a snapshot of which parts of a community are most likely from a health perspective to be most vulnerable during one of those hazards. Uh, maybe arguably more importantly, what they do is they, uh, they start that conversation. They force that conversation about, yeah, but what about the building in this area where it doesn't look vulnerable or uh, what are we gonna do about this? So it's it's fascinating research, highly quantitative. Uh, I like the spatial element and now we're, we're, we're uh, integrating with GOBC and some of their uh, spatial projects and data sets. And so I think this is going to be a product that, that really evolves and that we're quite excited about, but it's a, for us, it was a first step on operationalizing this concept of, of equity, figuring out who was or who was likely to be disproportionately uh, impacted during an event. We've done some uh, correlational analysis to this. Uh, so our model is on the left uh, or the model is on the left and some of our uh, actual health impact data is on the right. There's much more work to do. Our public health surveillance unit, which is our epidemiologists, uh, they spent a lot of time doing COVID related work. And so we're still just playing catch up as a health organization, but it's nice to see the model kind of bear fruit. We're not that surprised. Again, for us, we're interested in its evolution and in how it actually uh, influences policy. So we wouldn't necessarily say use this map on the left to decide where you're gonna put a cooling center, but certainly it could be part of the suite of information that you use during that process. So the dark red is more severe. Yeah. Okay. And so why is it 
I'm, I'm loud enough. Why is it concentrated on the east side of the city? So it'll be concentrated there. That's where you're going to have more folks who have those various risk factors, whether vulnerable. it's vulnerable. Exactly. Yeah. And who, who would lack, say, poor quality housing, all those factors combined in a way that's like a little too complex for me to even explain. It produces that index, which has five quintiles. And so the darkest ones are where it's where folks are most vulnerable. And you see it kind of plays out to your, how your intuitions would be across the city. Thanks for that. So other ways that we've kind of operationalized this concept of equity, and I've got just part of a, uh, a table that we produced where we tried to outline the various groups uh, that are more susceptible during a, a climate related event. There's, there's more entries than this. There's probably 20 different categories and we tried to break down some of the demographics. But on the left, there's a few things I'd talk about, which is, you know, we're committed as a public health entity to this continual learning. So that means staying up on what's happening in the research, trying to wrap our head around how to properly characterize disproportionate impacts. It's not, it's not as easy as you would think. Uh, the second point is really exciting and we're, we're starting this process now, which is there was an article produced by Human Rights Watch after the extreme heat emergency of 2021 that was pretty scathing critique. I, I don't agree with all of it, but that the health system failed, especially folks with disabilities. And so whether or not we agree with that or not, there's also this movement to better engage folks with lived and living experience to understand how, <clears throat> excuse me, how they experience something like the heat dome and how we could better support them. And it might not be ways that are intuitive for us. So we're taking this, this clear project, the climate change uh, lived experience and resilience project and figuring out ways that we can now uh, build a capacity to engage directly with folks who lived and living experience from, a different, from different uh, affected populations, as well as the organizations that serve them. And so again, it's kind of making sure that we're hearing it directly from those that are impacted so that we don't develop programs that are uh, removed from their priorities. And this for us, you know, if you think of equity as having those cursory kind of two dimensions of inclusivity and decision-making and fairly distributed benefits, I think it, it helps us in both, but certainly in the, uh, in the uh, inclusive, inclusivity during decision-making. And finally, we're, we're continuing to figure out how to put an equity frame so-called on our implementation decisions. Uh, and, you know, we've really just entered the implementation phase of our work. So this is, again, something that's uh, starting to evolve. But it, for us, because we're in such a big region, we have a lot of rural and remote communities. We knew at the beginning of the Health Adapt Project, for example, that the Central Coast, which is home to five First Nations, cities of Bella Bella, Bella Coola, and others doesn't always get the same amount of attention as some of the other areas within Vancouver Coastal Health. And so we were able to there just prioritize, just it wasn't in a very rigorous way. We just knew that we wanted to send some of our resources that way and spend some time working in that uh, area. So uh, again, just other ways that this, uh, this plays out. I've just got a few more things left to cover. There's the role of a health authority in reconciliation, you saw we've got 14 First Nations within our health region. We work closely with First Nations Health Authority. Uh, but what we've done is we've sought to include uh, Indigenous knowledge in our assessment of our vulnerability across the region and our capacity. So there's dozens of Indigenous-led <clears throat> initiatives, excuse me, that are reflected in our capacity assessment. Uh, we've you know, even now, again, I'm really focused on the drinking water piece because that's something that we're, we're all talking about in the next uh, little while, is this co-governance. So we need to make decisions with First Nations about bulk water sourcing, about drinking water systems, <clears throat> about regulation and enforcement. So that's kind of an exciting piece of this. And I'm 
as soon as I can, uh, getting in touch with the folks uh, who oversee the, the BC First Nations climate strategy and, and action plan to figure out those health related actions that we can implement. Because this is a kind of a neat, again, in that co-production model, we, we, we're often in contact with entities uh, for whom health is not in their direct control, for whom health service delivery is not their primary mandate, but in partnership, we can kind of uh, resolve that for them by doing the actions that they need done. And, and the same kind of works in reverse too. I'm just, how are we for time? We're a little, we're a little after two. No, oh, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. So just a, f a few more. So the, the health system piece is really important. And I just want to flag some of the work that, uh, that folks at the Ministry of Health are leading, including a baseline assessment of health resilience that uses this resilience assessment framework from the World Health Organization. Those results aren't public yet, but the, the work has been done. There's a ton of action happening in part through funding from the Climate Preparedness and Adaptation Strategy. So it's $13 million, which isn't a lot for a number of health entities to try and develop programming with, but it's certainly uh, a step in the right direction. For us, a main piece of, uh, I guess, a main motivating force and, and accountability dimension of this work comes from the coroner's report that was released after the extreme heat emergency, which lists a number of actions. For example, exploring air conditioners as medical devices. Uh, what would that look like? What should that look like? Should people be allowed to apply for based on their uh, vulnerabilities uh, to have a temporary air conditioner delivered to their home for the summer or whatever that program is going to look like? The program is, is being researched and kind of developed right now. So it's, it's exciting. A lot of other recommendations came from that report too. Uh, one of which was BC HARS, which is our heat alert response system. This is when I first put up that heat dome slide with all the various records being broken. This is, uh, this is one of the things that gives me a lot of hope is that this, this is uh, a group now that works during the off season, but during heat events, you've got Environment and Climate Change Canada, Emergency Management BC, BC Center for Disease Control, uh, all the health authorities, local governments, et cetera, that are at the table deciding, they're getting information about forecasting, they're deciding if an extreme heat emergency is likely to be, to be declared, what that looks like regionally. Uh, and to me, it's emblematic of a fairly sophisticated level of coordination between entities that weren't always as well coordinated. Uh, so the heat alert response system was absolutely recommended by the coroner's report uh, and it worked really well this season there's a lot of after season debriefs that are happening right now but for me uh, a big success one of the things that comes out of working in a space like this i think is the difficulty of figuring out how we all fit together what should the province be doing and what should environment and climate change canada be doing what do we do what do the local governments do and so there's, there's that complexity. Then there's also this, I feel like people have uh, a predilection, whatever the word is, for collaboration before coordination sometimes. And so we're kind of over collaborating sometimes. I think our, our kind of motto right now is coordinating before collaborating uh, just to make sure that the various folks in these systems know what each other is up to, to eliminate redundant work uh, and to then collaborate when it's needed on certain projects. And it's been uh, really key, especially in our, in the indigenous context that we work in, you need to know how you fit into those kind of spaces uh, before you decide what it is you're going to do. So that takes work and relationship building. But for me, it's really important because we've seen a couple of false starts or folks moving a little too fast in the wrong direction, et cetera. So, um, so role clarity, one of my, one of my uh, main pieces here. There's a lot of things we're, we're hoping to continue to develop our expertise on and that the health sector is taking uh, quite seriously. There's, 
all sorts of resources now around the mental health impacts of climate change. Uh, they're still not very well understood, especially not from a data kind of driven perspective. And uh, before we left, Heidi kind of mentioned that low carbon resilience, what's, you know, understanding the relationship between adaptation goals and mitigation goals. Should we be working on both simultaneously? What does that look like? As well, I think there's a huge opportunity for the health sector to demonstrate the co-benefits of a variety of, of policy choices, including housing, for example. Um, and yeah, I think partnerships with community drive our work really strongly. Uh, we're especially now uh, partnering with smaller community-based organizations. They're really the conduit to the people that we serve. So this has been a, uh, a very fruitful kind of line of practice for us. Uh, we want to partner more with researchers. I think the health sector does some of its own publishing by virtue of having epidemiologists and some uh, MDs and PhDs, but we don't get our work out nearly enough. Uh, and so we're, we've just hired a research and evaluation lead for our public health uh, program to try and drive some of that. And there's a lot of questions like around monitoring and evaluation that I think researchers are, are really well suited uh, to answer. There's, uh, there's a lot of difficulty there in demonstrating the impact of our work and uh, we, can, we can often use the help. And I, I finally, how will I speak to this last point? I, it's, it's mostly just to name drop Andrea. If you've seen Andrea McNeil, Dr. Andrew McNeil speak, uh, she's got a planetary health lab here at UBC. She's an oncologist surgeon and just an amazing person. But we're, you know, we've folded some of our practice into planetary health now because what we do in public health and with adaptation work relates to some of their objectives. But it's, it's, I think I mostly put it out there as a way to like remind us all to be opportunistic when a new uh, concept or paradigm comes along like planetary health that we can we can uh, hop aboard and, and get even more done. So I have covered a lot. I really look forward to the discussion. I'm going to leave it there for now. Uh, and uh, we'll be in touch to follow up some of those questions, but I'll keep a note too for any that come up and please be in touch uh, with me as well. So thank you very much, Craig. Thanks, 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 thanks. So we're gonna open it up for questions and um, I'm gonna to have to pass around the microphone because uh, for the people on Zoom, they will not be able to hear the questions. So um, who would like to, okay, yeah. Yes, okay. Who would like to first open up with questions? The question. And oh, there might be, yes, yeah. Okay. My question is uh, related to um, mental health and climate change, and especially what I've observed among, well, in two populations, young people and 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 Indigenous people, both for good reason. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, my, my observation is that anxiety, of course, is a major component of the mental health response to climate change and hugely problematic. Uh, and being disempowered is very much a part of it. And that's where young people in general and indigenous people in particular uh, share much in common in terms of access to resources, a history of being in charge of your own life, of running things, of having a voice that is heard, et cetera, et cetera. So my, my question is to what extent is Vancouver Coastal Health uh, focused on the climate change in, in regard to um, young people? I recognize that you're uh, reaching out and, and uh, making connections with indigenous communities, but uh, I think, as I've just said, for my, my take on things and my, my own research and experience suggests that there's a lot in common here and anxiety is uh, a, a big part of, uh, of uh, what the problem is when it comes to climate change in these two populations. Yeah, it's a great question. And it's, I think it's a big challenge for, for most of us right now with, with 
just the perception of terrible news. But so at VCH, we've been a part of a couple of pilot kind of, you know, knowledge assessments and those types of things that bring together an awareness of the, like try to put some precision around the eco-anxiety or the climate grief. We don't yet have a program that's directly providing support for this, I don't think. But I know that in our virtual care practice, they do kind of psychosocial well-being work after extreme events. And I think that's a place where that could become more proactive and more um, more of something that doesn't just happen in response to an event. But I think you're right on, eh, that, that it's... There's this concept, if you heard of it, the solstasia or solstasia, right? Where you just kind of, as your place changed, you worked in the north. I mean, it, you've no doubt experienced it. Um, whereas the landscape changes, this this produces uh, obviously an, an anxiety response, a sadness response. I think I think so. Supporting this, it's it's in our work plan to to develop expertise on this and to develop programming around this. Specifically, I think with addressing the anxiety of it. Uh, but also, I think there's an opportunity to, to remind folks too, that there is that hope through action piece, you know, that, that even taking small actions can start to rectify some of that and can put you in that virtuous cycle where, uh, where you're likely to do even more. Um, but you probably have other thoughts too, and I'm, I'm keen to hear those. Oh, yeah. Just following up on that, but mobilization, mobilization, of, uh, mobilization of population, mobilization of people, and sitting around and being anx anxious is one thing, but the anxiety is dealt with effectively by becoming involved in and participating in and being involved by taking actions that address that which is causing the anxiety. So we're looking at a whole process here of social mobilization, yeah. and and the the among young people who. Uh, are dealing most effectively with this. They, they're the ones that are, quote, causing so much, del what I call delightful trouble out there. And if anything, we need more of it. I mean, this is healthy. It's not something negative at all. Yeah, yeah and I, I view our roles, I think there's an opportunity too, to provide even more context and information about, about how folks can get involved, maybe even in the health realm, maybe with neighbors checking in on neighbors. Like, I, I agree, I, I like seeing the trouble and I, and I think we've got to find a way to channel that too. Just to follow up on the last one, uh, absolutely, it's an enormous issue. Uh, climate anxiety amongst youth is now well-documented and a serious problem. The greater problem is, of course, much of this relies, lies at the level of the schools, uh, not nearly, really VCH. Um, but are, are the schools at all aware of this? Absolutely not. The, the climate change education in our high school, all the way up our whole school system is woefully inadequate. Uh, and I have no idea what to do about that. We can wail and squeal as climate scientists, but it's very difficult. Sorry to be negative. No, and if anything, and this is just my own point of view, it feels like we might be, we're good at saying how, how, how challenging the future is, but it's really, I think the power does come and you don't want to blow smoke. You don't want to provide kind of solutions that don't matter, but I think it's maybe that part is missing too. And I know we have, we have partnerships with schools and there's just so much work to do. It's, it's not at our, our, it's not something we talk about all the time, but I agree with you. It's, it's all hands on deck for this, for sure. So thank you, Craig. You've thrown an awful lot of information at us and we feel informed. I'm glad to see that uh, the public services are acting on our behalf in such a, an active way. But I have a, an insidious kind of question, which is not meant to be cynical. Every time we have an extreme event, absolute chaos seems to reign in this province. And I wonder what is the objective evidence that we as a province are ahead of the game? My comparable level of information comes from Switzerland and Austria, which suggests that they don't seem to collapse 
uh, when any extreme event occurs. No, there, there are obviously exceptions to that. What I would like to ask is, what evidence do we have that we are clearly ahead of the game in, in BC? That's a really good question. I think to the extent that I made that claim, it would be probably nationally, but I think we do fall apart. I think there's only evidence, like the, the atmospheric river and the attendant flooding and debris flows and everything that happened last year, the impacts to the highway system, I think it, it showed just how um, vulnerable those systems are. And I think the amount of resources that are going towards those recovery efforts, I, I said that that takes away from other proactive planning that could have taken place. So yeah, I, 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 I don't have that evidence. And in fact, I probably agree with you more than, more than I had implied earlier. Yeah. Thanks, Craig. Uh, your team is both uh, quite large and uh, has been very energetic, and you've given us a lot of insight into what they're doing and what you're doing. But it occurred to me to wonder whether there are similar teams working in Fraser Health and Interior Health and Northern Health, and you're nodding, so I take it that there are. It's starting. It's starting. But my, the reason I asked that first question is to wonder why it is starting. Uh, to what extent are your insights going to be very different from those generated by Fraser Health or Interior Health? And if we're replicating these kinds of teams and these kinds of um, planning processes and diagrams across the country, uh, are we actually, in the end, much enhancing our understanding of the issues, or are we simply replicating knowledge endlessly uh, to a certain level at very considerable cost? And if that is partway the case, might we not be better off asking some kind of small national think tank to figure this out and then spend the rest of the money on actually getting ahead of the game, to use Olaf's phrase. Excellent question. So a bit of background is that we are, so this role that I'm in, the Climate Change and Health Lead, uh, that, that's now as a result of the funding from the Ministry of Health been replicated. So I think each of the health authorities now either has one or will have one. I share your sentiment exactly though, and, and continually encourage them not to do this lengthy vulnerability and capacity assessment. Uh, I think they can do it much more quickly than we did. I think there's a role for the province to, to maybe just produce that knowledge, but I do think it's essential for those folks to be in those roles to implement. And that's largely what they're gonna do. So they only, only somebody from Interior Health knows how to liaise with those communities effectively and to support protecting health outcomes in those communities during and after extreme events. So in that way, we need the roles, I think, and you need, in an organization, in organizations as big as these health authorities, you need a, a point person, like a focal point to, to, to harmonize or whatever the word is, activity across the health authority. But I totally take your point. They don't need, the planning should be quick. They should, like the message I delivered to, th to those folks is that they, that the planning and assessment or the assessment and planning work is important, but you should transition through it as quickly as possible. Because we, and it was in part by, by virtue of the fact that we were funded by Health Canada, we were kind of encouraged to go at a slower pace and really dive into their methodology and do all this. But looking back, it was 18 months that you now could distill in a much shorter time. So I don't think we're in that. I don't think we're going to do much of that in the province. I, I really, yeah, because I think there's so much of a focus now on action and results. Like ultimately, that's where that's where we're looking now is like, okay, it's great to do a presentation like this, but now we, we, in a year, we should have to be demonstrating impact of this work, not just listing the things we've done, but really starting to say why they've been effective. And if not, what are we going to do different? So that's what I hope. I hope they can leapfrog from our project is the whole. It's a good question. Thank you. So thank you, Craig. So we have some questions um, on Zoom. Um, so this is from Shauna Butterick. Uh, in relation to equity, it seems essential 
to apply an ableist analysis to any policy and programs, as so much is unfortunately based on assumptions about ability, as was evidenced in the messaging that occurred in the COVID pandemic that made huge assumptions about people's actually little living conditions. So that is a great question, but maybe you could just comment. Absolutely, and this is exactly the place where we've learned by listening, I think. So um, during uh, the Extreme University of Econ, we knew that people were having trouble getting to cool spaces. Uh, that's just a challenge. So, Part of that is solved by, you know, PC nonprofit housing association and others were able to provide bigger what cover the cost of folks to travel. But when you're talking about somebody that's living with a disability, that travel is, you know, it could be very maladaptive to ask somebody to spend 40 minutes in the heat trying to get to spend two hours in a cool space, right? And so um, we're that's part of why we're doing the engagement that we're doing, which is really to, to interact directly with. with folks that live with disabilities from a variety of different kind of settings to figure out so what what can we do is it is it setting up you know there's even talk of mobile cooling centers there's this air conditioners medical devices maybe there's a shuttle service that would be more appropriate but we agree we're, we're and it's not just in climate change work but in our environments work and, and all that there's there's an increasing uh, desire use that kind of table with life. And one of the things that's that's surprising and counterintuitive is when we're engaging with that community, I think I've heard from that community that the pandemic had a silver lining in that they can now attend more events quite easily through Zoom, right? Zoom was really good for people. My mom lived with a disability all life. It was really it's really good for people that can't get out of the house and you know so when we're shaping our engagement and our, our current we're mindful, you know, there's a, there's a lot of pressure to get back to in person, right? And so there's great things that happen in person, but there's also a lot of benefits for certain communities to be in person. So those are some of the ways that we're thinking about it. Definitely committed to this now. Okay, thank you. And so uh, Joanne Archibald, who is actually one of our uh, uh, emeritus cohort uh, of Alton's project. Um, she has asked, how are the needs and input of Indigenous people living off reserve ensured? Yeah, excuse me, so that's a great question. We're in the process, and it's it's over 50%, I believe, in British Columbia of, um, uh, of indigenous folks that live away from home or on reserve. There's, for us, again, this is where that role clarity thing comes, is we have to follow kind of a, a chain, I guess a, a set of protocols, right? With, there's organizations that serve urban indigenous populations, and for us to just go directly to them and try to start a project might contravene, you know, a relationship that First Nations Health Authority is building or our own indigenous health team. Uh, so we uh, we're in the process though of a big project with the BC Association of Aboriginal Friendship Centers, who has uh, a location down on the side and. We're using that as a pilot to, to support them in developing a business case, kind of like a funding proposal for making their uh, operations and facilities resilient that then will roll out not only to other friendship centers, but to other uh, organizations that serve with indigenous populations. So we're trying, it's not, again, it's not always easy and we need to, to make sure that we're doing it respectfully and appropriately, which takes time, uh, but we've got a big, Team now, Indigenous uh, Health team, who's solely focused on us, you know, they're largely Indigenous, and so it, it helps to ensure that we're doing things in a culturally appropriate way. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's one of our priorities, and it's something that we're definitely working on. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question. <laughs> um, so I'm curious at the language you used in the um, equity and climate change framework. Um, because, I mean, you know, if you really want to ensure that, you know, certain populations are not going to be impacted, wouldn't it be, like, for me, it would seem like you would want to say, okay, this is about poverty, this is about unsheltered, this is about, you know, we have to deal with some of these issues if we really want to. I mean, when you look at that report, the coroner report, 
it was they were poor predominantly poor uh, um, aging canadians you know yeah. Yeah. who were living in in inadequate housing yeah. so i don't see the language in the in the framework oh, that's interesting <laughs> um Excuse me, I think that's in part because class and, and class position and income has been somewhat obscured lately as, as a primary determinant of person's vulnerability. I think uh, race and gender rightfully have taken up a lot of, uh, of that space. And I think it's reflected maybe in some of the language we use. And we're, I've been kind of trying to remind us to get back to just saying that just saying poverty like, and even material deprivation i get it I, I know it's like the more it's like it's it's not it's not all elderly people that are susceptible you know no, if you're in a single family home with air conditioning we don't we're not thinking about it. Right. we're thinking about the the single guy who's you know 80 living alone no family in a rental nobody checking in that's what we're thinking about and so yeah, I agree. We need to get more direct with our language. It's something that kind of got this obscured along the way. So I, I agree with this. I think it needs to be more. Yeah. More, yeah well, more I mean, otherwise, it it it's you know it's just like it, it won't they won't they won't see the immediacy of it. Yeah. I mean, there are things that could be done. Yes. You know. So. No, absolutely. And it's, I was talking to the thing before. I'm relieved I don't have to work on the wicked problem of housing. But it's obviously part and parcel with climate resilience as a, mm -hmm. as a, as a goal, uh, access to housing. There's one interesting anecdote, which is that during the heat dome, deaths were far lower in the downtown east side than we would expect. But that's mm -hmm. because they're so supported, you know, socially, there's more close contact with the health setting, et cetera. But um, no, I agree. We need to do much better. Right. Okay. So, any other questions? Okay. Sure. Hi, my name is Curtis. A uh, little background. Uh, I'm involved in commercial agriculture in East Africa and same with carbon capture and sequestration. So I'm a little bit more familiar with the food industry and some of the struggles that are around that globally right now. Uh, you touched on water during droughts in Canada and how that might affect crops. But I'm also wondering about as climate gets worse, Canada's implemented fertilizer bans. Obviously, that's going to reduce the amount of food that's here and there's supply chain issues around the world. Costs are going up and there's shortages that people are noticing already. Uh, baby formulas, different things like that. And that's obviously going to impact, impact poor individuals in certain communities more. I didn't see anything about monitoring health from malnutrition or anything. And if you're projecting for the increase that's expected to come with that over the years. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm wondering if you've seen any or you have a monitoring system uh, to check for malnutrition and how that's going to increase stress on the healthcare system because of rising food insecurity that's going to be continuing. Thank you. Chris, that's a really, really good question. I think for, for us in the process thus far, the food security, food safety, food security piece has been the least developed. Unfortunately, it's, and that's in part because it's so complex. You touched on it, right? Where our food security is kind of more global communication. But I know we have um, community dietitians. I know we track, I, I would, I know we track a lot of different health outcomes, but I wouldn't think we track something uh, related to nutrition in the way that you've suggested. And I, I don't think we do it in the context of changing climate either. So it's a really, it's an excellent insight. And I think this is the, we're in this process of public health and I won't go into how we're structured, but it is, we're getting better at working together across various teams. One of whom is the dietitian for folks that might think about that more. And and arguably one of the more important indicators that we come up with too of, of how this is impacting health. Thanks. Hope that answers it somewhat. It's mostly just thank you for another recommendation. Not a problem. It's it's something I see a little bit more frequently. There was severe drought out there this year with the rain being coming. 
that might be 25 million people request to now it's Yeah. Um, so it leads to a lot of problems that I see firsthand. It's worse and worse. So how is that? Yeah, have you done? <laughs> and it's not, I, I don't think even tracking it in the context of, of just climate sensitive hazards. I'm thinking too about, you know, when you're assuming more and more people that are just living in paycheck to paycheck just to have a home, you know what I mean? And so I think there's going to be those sacrifices where people are not taking care of themselves. Yeah, that's also why I was wondering if that's monitored because food costs are going to continue to go up. People living paycheck to paycheck might not be able to afford the costs of yeah. everything going. Same with poor communities or impoverished people. It's gonna, well, sorry, it's gonna it's gonna lead to potentially more health incomes that are gonna impact the health system. So I was just curious if that was being monitored. Yeah. My my sense is that it's not. I always hear you always hear the media of, of people accessing um, you know, food banks and those types of things. You don't don't hear about it from the how would you do that? Okay, well, I have a question. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know. I mean, this is a, I've thought about this and I'm not sure how you would go about looking into this, but one, one of the things around communities that are, that, that have, that are, that are low income, you know, that there is a lot more sharing. There's a lot more, more, you know, you're kind of recycling. You know, they're using up, you know, things that are found in whatever. And so, is there any way that you've thought about doing that of of demonstrating that 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 you know um, these communities are not a drain on society, but they're actually doing what we really be, need yeah. to be doing. As a whole society, and they've been doing it for a long time. I mean, but that it bothered that whole thing bothers me though, because then that means, you know, it's it's uh, you know we're not sort of addressing their needs, yeah. but we're just sort of you know it may be paternalistic sort of. Yeah. Right? So it's a complicated thing. No, so. Really good. so here's how I think about it. It, it makes me think of yeah, like resilience as a concept would be double edged, and, and uh, I have a colleague really one of the low, but she's amazing. I, I know her. Oh, my God. She's so smart, but she, she shared an example in the course of World Road Racing about, uh, uh, I think it was a chief, but maybe an elder that she was working with who, who really urged her not to, to call them resilient. Because what that means is now you can just stop giving us resources. Yes. Like, okay, you're resilient, yeah. you can take care of yourself. But on the other hand, I think that lots of community, or communities, uh, communities, yeah, like even just social connection, you know? Uh, they have a lot of resources that we don't capture in those models, like those community resources that we don't we don't capture. So we we're aware of the fact that we, we miss things like that, and I think we're you're you're right to or just you, you want to celebrate them, but you don't want to do it in a way that absolves you of taking care of the real problems. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's another point well taken, um, and and this is I hope I hope all of these don't sound just like a cop out. It's really all fodder for things that we will continue to prioritize as we grow as an entity and as this still practice it falls across the problems. But yeah, well there, there actually is a methodology. It's called community asset mapping. Yeah. You know, so you might want to look into that. I mean, and I think you know some of your staff might know about it. So yeah. is there any other questions? Can you just talk a little bit about actions? You did use the word implementation at one point. I, I hear all the planning and all the... What are the actions that are actually being done? Yeah, so I mean... I sure Building I, dikes, you know, whatever. Oh, well, <laughs> well the, yeah, those things. I mean, if we just think about heat for a minute, it's, um, I think there's a lot of action, like the city, of Vancouver, for example, you know, operating cooling centers and missing stations and other programs, BC Nonprofit Housing Association providing that 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 transportation coverage for folks, us providing data to folks uh, in real time, the, the check-in guide that we 
that we produce, the trainings that we deliver to community organizations. So I think those to me get us closer to to action. Um, but again, I I I feel the sentiment of that, and I we're motivated in the same way. We're just, we're just at the beginning of really becoming a well-oiled machine here, um, and focusing just on on doing the project and, and the program. So uh, we're doing our best, I think. Uh, and there's there's my mind is a bit like a sieve too, so there's likely things in uh, a list that would need to wrap off some things, but. Uh, Hopefully that gives you a sense of some of the things that we think of in terms of action, but obviously we um, So I, I, if there isn't any other questions, I'm going to just ask one more question yeah. and then we'll we'll end it. Um, so you, I think you might have got some sense of what this cohort is about, the yeah. the, the Emir Emirates cohort, um, you know, in this larger project. You know, so what do you think this cohort could could be contributing? I mean, what you know, be given you know, there is a lot of knowledge here out here. So you know, how do you think it's the best thing that we could be doing? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, beyond all of the suggestions, and I'm I'm very thankful that it's been recorded because there's at least a dozen things that I made a mental note of, some of which will evaporate. So I think just in in the suggestions we made in terms of our work, I think there's probably an opportunity I and mean, your networks have to be so large at this point that uh, you know there's potential connections that could be made especially with active researchers that could maybe you know answer some of those questions we need to capacity to uh, I think you know there is is isn't there a youth cohort too mm -hmm. so I think just you know that might be an opportunity to, to next question for, for us to learn a little bit more from from that community what you know I would love to hear from that group what what some public health programs could be like that. So there's maybe connecting to some of the other people. I definitely applaud the effort. It's uh, an inspiring group, and I'm thankful you've been part of the process. Okay. So thank you. So again, let's give a round of applause. I'm going to now turn it over. Thanks very much, uh, Craig. We appreciate the time and effort that you put into this presentation, and we look forward to further interaction with you. Absolutely. Now, the Emeritus College, UBC's Emeritus College, is uh, rather a uh, poor organization, but we do want you to have the pleasure of receiving a much wanted measure of our appreciation and yes. tomorrow tomorrow you'll need it yes. <laughs> so thank you so much thank you thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yep. thanks everybody